Good evening. Thank you. As you can tell, I'm trying to evoke yes. Vienna tonight. <laughs> Vienna is central to our story. Franz Schubert was born in Vienna in 1797. His father was a school teacher. Now, when we say Vienna, we really mean a crossroads of Central Europe where people who were Hungarian and Czech and Croatian and Polish, Silesian, all came together. When we lived in Vienna, the Viennese like to say, if you scratch a true Viennese, immediately beneath the surface, you see one of those Eastern European countries emerge. <laughs> Schubert's father's background was Czech, his mother's background was Polish, and so Schubert was a true Viennese. Now, the school where his father taught was right by their home in the Ninth District. If you know Vienna, that's just north of the inner city by the Volksoper, by the People's Opera. And Schubert went to his father's school. He took music lessons from his father when he was six years old. His father was not a professional musician, but he was a capable violinist. And Schubert quickly showed that he was able to absorb at a phenomenal rate whatever he was taught. So all the rudiments of music, of playing the violin, of playing the piano, uh, and even all, already at age six of composing, Schubert took to so easily. And when he was seven, he had the opportunity to sing for a man whom many of you have heard of named Antonio Salieri. Now, whether or not Salieri killed Mozart, he was, <laughs> he was very good to Franz Schubert. He, in fact, gave Schubert a position in the imperial choir in Vienna. Now, Schubert was seven. Schubert could read anything. He had an amazing ear. If he heard something, he could repeat it. And apparently, he also had a beautiful voice and loved to sing. So Schubert was right away in the company of other excellent musicians. And of course, being the absorbing kind of brain that he was, he quickly learned many things. He had two older brothers, Ferdinand and Ignaz, who uh, both played the violin and his father played the cello. So they had a family quartet. Franz was obliged to take up the viola, which he did very successfully, so he played violin and viola. The family quartet would play the Haydn, the Mozart. Haydn would have been both Joseph Haydn and his brother Michael Haydn. And uh, all of this music filled the Schubert home. Now Schubert really was quite content with this world, but as he matured, he had the opportunity to go to a school called the Stadtkonvikt when he was 11 years old. And here he was exposed to not only uh, the kind of music that we've been talking about, home chamber music, but also symphonic repertoire. The school had an orchestra. Franz played in this orchestra, had the opportunity to play Beethoven symphonies for the first time in his life. And this was transformative uh, for him. He, developed two favorite pieces of music. He has great taste, as you can tell, at 11 years old, Mozart's 40th Symphony and Beethoven's Second Symphony, and immediately wrote uh, a symphony himself sort of to imitate these. And um, so by 13, Franz Schubert was, was writing symphonies. Now, when you are in a choir, uh, there is a sad or happy moment, depending how you think about it, when your voice changes. Franz Schubert was given the opportunity to surgically avoid this moment, but he uh, declined. <laughs> he declined. You have to remember, in the early 1800s, that was still a pretty popular thing to do, you know? Because if you were lucky and you were one of the, the castrati who was a real rock star, you, your life was made. Uh, of course, if you were one of the other 99%, and kind of lost out on all fronts. So Schubert, <laughs> Schubert decided to attain full manhood 
and he uh, continued, of course, to love the human voice. So he was uh, writing symphonies, he was writing chamber music, but he was also writing songs. Now, when he was 16, he fell in love with a young soprano named Teresa Grop, and he wrote a number of sacred pieces for her. This was probably to appease her parents because Schubert was not a religious man. But he wrote her a Salve Regina, and he wrote her a Tantum Ergo. In fact, he wrote her a whole mass. But there was a law in Vienna that if you could not prove that you had the means to support a wife, you were not allowed to marry. And Schubert was very poor, and there was no way that he could support Teresa Grope or anybody else. So uh, that was not to be. However, Schubert did not stop writing songs. He had been to this marvelous school and been exposed to all the best German literature and poetry, not just German literature. He loved uh, literature from other countries, read it in translation. Schubert almost never left Vienna during his entire life. He went a few, uh, you know, 200 kilometers away, maybe four or five times. He went to Graz, he went to Hungary once. But uh, the story of Schubert centers on Vienna, Viennese life, Viennese culture, and Viennese music. So imagine, if you will, that uh, all the many musicians who came to Vienna, Beethoven came from Bonn and Mozart came from Salzburg, but Schubert began there, ended there, and spent almost all of his life there. Schubert's love of poetry uh, was quite widespread, but his favorite poet, was Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And he set 74 poems of Goethe to music in his short life. Overall, he set over 600 German poems to music. Somebody said if Schubert had lived long enough, he would have set all of the German poetry that existed during his lifetime <laughs> to song. But why are Schubert's songs so special? It's not just because he wrote so many of them. Over 600 songs is a lot of songs, but it's also because he created a way of using the song, the Lied, the German Lied, uh, that expressed more than even Mozart or Beethoven or Haydn had done before him. Part of the way he did this was to use the accompaniment as a means of depicting some characteristic of the song. Now, if there is a physical object in the song, like a song about a brook, he could uh, easily ripple in the piano so that it sounds like a brook, like a, this is a song by Schubert. I have to sing it, though. That's the, I'll find a key where I can sing Ich hört ein Bächlein rauschen vom aus dem Felsen quell. So throughout the song, he not only has the German text set beautifully, but he has an accompaniment that demonstrates the ever-running brook. So early on, Schubert chose a poem by Goethe from Faust, part one. Now, Goethe wrote Faust, part one, in 1808. And uh, by this time, Goethe was respected. He was in his 50s. He, he was 59 years old. And uh, Goethe really captured the entire Sturm und Drang romantic spi spirit of German literature at the time. As you know, Faust Part I is about old Faust deciding he's willing to become young Faust, and the price he has to pay is giving his soul to the devil. And in order to make sure that Faust uh, keeps his bargain, the devil makes sure that young Marguerite Gretchen is the um, object of Faust's love and that she falls for him. So in Faust, the poem, um, Gretchen, who is a simple country girl, a beautiful, simple country girl, is sitting at her spinning wheel. And f uh, the, the genius of this song Schubert wrote when he was 17 years old is that he recreates in the accompaniment the sound of a moving spinning wheel and at one point, Gretchen becomes so absorbed in her thoughts about how much she loves Faust, she doesn't know who he is yet, uh, that, that she stops. And the wheel comes to a halt. You can hear it stop. And then you can hear her start it up again until it gets going. 
she sings, my rest is gone. I will never find it again. Every time I see him, it's as if my mind is shaking. I'm so in love. So I have a special guest for you tonight. Jenna Browning will sing a Gretchen am Spinnrada, Gretchen at her spinning wheel. This is not Peter. Not what? Not Peter. <laughs>
you can tell already at 17, Schubert had a wonderful feeling, not only for the voice, but for drama. As the character becomes more agitated, the wheel spins into more distant harmonic regions and even speeds up. Or if she becomes suddenly reflective, it's suddenly pianissimo. So Schubert turns out dozens and dozens of these wonderful works, but at the moment, he's a teenager and he isn't yet in the public eye in any way. However, fortunately for Schubert, because of his studies at the Stadtkonvikt, there are young men his age who are more wealthy who decide that they're going to help Schubert out because they can tell he's exceptionally talented. So Johann von Spaun gives him manuscript paper. Schubert didn't have his own manuscript paper and he couldn't afford to buy it. He filled up in that year 20,000 bars of, of manuscript paper. That's a lot of music writing. <laughs> If you look at Schubert's whole output, and it's impossible to say how many hours of music a composer writes, but, but Schubert, after Mozart, among the great composers, wrote more music than anyone else, uh, even though his life ended before he was 32 years old. So he was incredibly prolific. He described his life as, I get up, I begin to compose, and when one piece is finished, I start another. <laughs> so this was true for most of his life from age 17 or 18 to age 31. But he did find time for his friends, and because this is Vienna, they didn't have beers together, they had coffee, because Vienna revolves around coffee houses. And coffee houses are the center of where Viennese find out what is happening in the world. Now, Vienna is a real center politically, it still is, but in the early 1800s, uh, the whole map of, of political Europe was redrawn in Vienna. And uh, Napoleon attempted several times to take over Vienna, 1805 and 1809. So Vienna was a hotbed of political activity. Now, Music was the opiate of the Viennese, if you will, because the Viennese always had to deal with the conflicting powers of Europe trying to seize control in Vienna. Their remedy was to dance, to sing, and home pianos had become 10 or 20 times more common than they were just 20 years before. Schubert had an audience waiting for him to create new songs. So when he had the good fortune to meet a, a much older gentleman, a baritone named Michael Vogel, who wanted to champion Schubert's works, Vogel would sing these songs around Vienna and pretty soon people wanted Schubert in their homes so that he could play his music, his music could be sung, and it was exactly like this. You know, we'd have 75 wonderful people together in a room and uh, Schubert would sit down and sing or play or other people would play or sing his music. So these evenings became known as Schubertiaden. And Schubertiaden happened for the next 15 years uh, in Vienna. Schubert only gave one public concert in his life, and I'll mention that later, but the public concert was not the way of the musical world at that time. It was really a great pianist named Franz Liszt who uh, took the living room concert and elevated it into a grand affair in a concert hall where one lone hero strode out in his <laughs> tails and uh, performed magnificently while women swooned. And uh, I don't know what the men did, but they probably <laughs> picked the women up off the floor and swept them out of there before Franz Liszt could talk to them, you know? So Schubert was a much more unassuming person than Franz Liszt. He wasn't even five feet tall. And he was a chubby little guy and his friends called him Schwammel or little mushroom. So <laughs> Schubert was uh, able, in spite of his unassuming physique, to create these magnificent works that span the whole emotional breadth of all of human experience and, and all of German literature. Um, this next song is also to a poem by Goethe, a shorter poem. Uh, it's about the elf king, the Erlkönig. Now the Erlkönig is not immortal. The Erlkönig is the last thing you see before you die. And in this poem, 
there are four characters. So the singer has to portray all four characters. There's a narrator who sets the scene. Who is it that rides through the night wind galloping on his horse? It's the father with his child. Then we hear the voice of the father comforting the child. Then we hear the voice of the child saying, haven't you just seen Erlkönig? No, says the father, that was just the wind. That was just a willow tree. Then we hear the Erlkönig saying, come and play with me and my daughters. We have wonderful things in store for you. But then at the end of the poem, when the boy is shuddering, the Erlkönig says, and I'm asking you nicely, but if that doesn't make you come, then I will use force. And of course, Schubert, with his genius for writing art songs, depicts all of this not only in the singer's voice, but in the piano accompaniment. So you hear the galloping horse, you hear the wind, you hear the terror, and uh, it's something that Schubert wrote when he was 18 years old. So this is Der Erlkönig by Schubert. So good. 
I mentioned that Schubert had two brothers. There were actually five surviving Schubert children, but nine other children died in infancy. Now, this was not so unusual at the end of the, uh, of the 18th century, but you might wonder why an 18-year-old could write so deeply and knowledgeably about the death of children. It's because he witnessed it so frequently. Another thing that must be said is that Schubert was not, <laughs> he was not a normal fellow. Uh, often accompanying genius are abnormalities of psychology, and it's clear from Schubert's letters that he's what we would now call a bipolar person. Uh, in his music, we can hear joy and absolute exuberance, and seconds later, it flashes into tragedy and wretched misery. Uh, the drama in Schubert's music is extraordinary. Now, you would think, given this, that Schubert would be a great composer of operas. He was not. The operas that Schubert wrote were these over 600 songs in which human drama is compressed into three or four minutes. He wrote as many as 20 operas. He really was determined to write a great opera. During the time that Schubert was in his early 20s, Rossini had come to Vienna and swept the opera scene. Uh, you, you couldn't really compete with Rossini, you know. So the other thing, though, is that Schubert's operas, and I've heard some of them now, thank you, YouTube, um, have gorgeous melodies. What else does Schubert do but write gorgeous melodies? Uh, however, there is never an interruption. It's as though Schubert can't understand why somebody would want to interrupt the architectural span of a beautiful melody just because of a dramatic situation. So he is not as ideally suited to writing operas as the composers who come to mind as the greatest opera composers who ever lived, you know, Mozart and Verdi and Puccini and Richard Strauss. And so uh, Schubert nevertheless tirelessly wrote these, and um, one of the most fortuitous was incidental music for a play called Rosamunda. And the, the play Rosamunda <laughs> has some of Schubert's most beautiful music. Uh, but he didn't, he didn't have to write songs and set the text of the characters to, to song, in, except in a couple of spots. So uh, that stands out. But Schubert succeeded in doing many other things. Well, he'd written uh, six symphonies by the time he was 21, and these pieces were performed. They're glorious. Uh, I can't I don't have a small orchestra here for you, but uh, just to give you an I let's see. It's great music, and it just pours out of him. And as much as that piece is cheerful, there are tragic moments there, as I say, uh, are moments that span the whole spectrum of, of human emotion in Schubert's music. However, in 1822, Schubert contracted syphilis, and uh, it certainly contributed to his lifespan being very short. It also gave him a depth of perspective about human life, which influenced everything that he wrote after that. Schubert didn't leave us much in terms of writing. Uh, there, there are a few letters to friends and his father. His mother had died when he was 15. 
But in these letters, you can tell that the moment he realizes he's not only mortal, but probably only has a few years left, everything changes. So uh, the next symphony that he writes, instead of sounding like this, sounds like this. And then in a very hushed whisper, the strings. And an oboe. I think you know what's coming soon, right? So Schubert, yeah, <laughs> he's just a kid and he wrote that. <laughs> so at, at 25 years old, uh, Schubert writes two glorious movements of this symphony and then apparently stops. Uh, and scholars have debated for 200 years, why did Schubert stop? We have a sketch of 20 bars of a third movement and an even smaller sketch of a fourth movement. Symphonies, full symphonies had, had four movements then. But most of Schubert's great music was not discovered until after his death. Because as he said himself, as soon as he finished one piece, he started another. He rarely went to a publisher. And so all of these thousands of sheets of music, many, many were found in places where he had lived. He lived with his friends. Uh, some were found in meat packing houses, some were found in other random places. His fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh symphonies were lost and were all discovered by Arthur Sullivan of the Gilbert and Sullivan fame or Onward Christian Soldiers. Arthur Sullivan and George Grove had gone on a trip to Vienna and they, lo and behold, found four Schubert symphonies that nobody knew about. Uh, the great symphony, the, the one after the unfinished, French horns at the beginning. The, the um, Great Symphony was found 15 years after Schubert's death by Robert Schumann. And as these works came out, Schubert's reputation grew and grew. But most of his fame came after his death. Uh, 40 years after his death, when these 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th symphonies were discovered, suddenly there was a craze for Schubert, and Viennese critics in the 1860s were comparing Brahms and Wagner unfavorably with Schubert, <laughs> which must have been really strange, because Schubert was long gone. Uh, you've perhaps seen a famous etching of uh, a Schubertiade, where Schubert is sitting at the piano, and dozens, uh, probably 40, 40 people are standing around, and they're all actually the, you know, modeled on the real people who were at those. But this was drawn by a fellow, uh, Moritz von Schwind, who'd been at those Schubertiades and was recreating it from memory 40 years after Schubert's death because he was suddenly so popular. So uh, there's hardly ever been a greater case of posthumous fame than with Franz Schubert. Other pieces like the giant uh, uh, piano trios, the B-flat trio and the E-flat trio, all found after his death. Uh, These pieces uh, that now are staples of the chamber music repertoire were written by Schubert and there was nobody who could play them. There was nobody who could really play the Erlkönig. He went to publishers and they said, why should we publish a piece that people can't play in their homes? Uh, it's, it's too difficult. So it took Michael Vogel uh, and six years later, um, Schubert's Erlkönig was published as Opus One. Uh, so he'd, he'd written it in 1815 and it finally appeared in 1821. Now, 
Diabelli, that's a name some of you music lovers may know. Diabelli had a publishing house. And Diabelli wrote music himself at a very uh, banal level. So he wrote a little waltz. And he invited anybody who wanted to be published by his publishing house to write a variation on his waltz. So uh, many composers participated gladly, including Schubert, including an 11-year-old Franz Liszt. And of course, Beethoven, uh, which is why the name is famous, wrote 33 variations on this theme. Uh, and it's an absolute <laughs> summit of, of musical achievement. So Schubert was, for a time, paid a pittance by Diabelli uh, for his songs. And songs that are now sung all over the world You know, made Schubert 15 cents here and 10 cents there. So Schubert kept scraping it together. Uh, fortunately, throughout his life, his friends or his brothers allowed him to live with them. We don't know a whole lot about his personal habits. He, he uh, had a sort of bizarre sense of humor. He liked to put a Kleenex or a tissue on a, on a comb and sing the part of death in the Erdelkönig through this so that it sounded like a kazoo. <laughs> So, yeah, I, it would have been fun to see Schubert just for a day. Uh, we, don't, we don't know a whole lot. But this outpouring of, of magnificent chamber music and masses, he wrote six masses, not just that one for Therese Grop. Uh, as I said, Schubert was not a believer, and he certainly didn't like the idea of a church who felt that their adherents would go to heaven where others would not. So whenever he wrote a mass, he took the words et in unum sanctum catholicum et apostolicum ecclesiam out of the credo. He didn't want those words in there. So if you ever hear a Schubert mass and you grew up Catholic and you know the text really well and it's playing along in your head and suddenly whoop, there's a little deletion, that's why, that's why that happens. Uh, of course, Schubert was a talented pianist. Uh, he was not a great pianist like Liszt or Chopin or uh, Schumann, um, but he, he certainly wrote gigantic piano parts and expected a lot of pianists. There's a work, uh, a song called the, the Wanderer. It's a, a three minute song and Schubert takes his own song and turns it into a half hour piano fantasy. It's his probably most difficult virtuosic piano, I, I don't know. for 29 and a half more minutes, okay? <laughs> so uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece that I've never played. But um, Schubert himself tried to play it for friends at a party once, and he said, what the devil? Nobody can play this thing. So uh, he, he created things that were beyond his own skill level as an interpreter, uh, excuse me, as, a, as, a, as an executor. But thank goodness, because now we have these fabulous works. There's 14 piano sonatas, and of course, the piano parts in dozens and dozens of magnificent uh, chamber works. So um, I am gonna play you a piece that I actually do know. Um, and this is an impromptu that Schubert wrote uh, a little later on in his life. The impromptu was a piano piece that was as though it were improvised. Now, of course, they are composed, but they are based on the composer's improvisations. You remember I mentioned a theater work called Rosamunde. Well, Rosamunde uh, had a tune in it that went something like this. And Schubert just turned it a little, turned it around and uh, made it the subject of an impromptu with several variations. Uh, you can tell in this that, again, Schubert takes liberties with the tune so that it becomes 
many different emotions. He, he doesn't just stick to the, the, the ups and downs of the melody. Listen to how far Schubert takes this. You know, before we do this, I have a better idea. Um, there's another song of Schubert's, which is quite famous and wonderful, and it shows a lighter side, a lighter side of Schubert. Um, there's a poem by not Schubert, but Schubart, and this poem is called Die Forelle, the Trout. Schubert loved nature, and I would say it's fair to say that in this early 19th century Germanic literary sensibility, uh, nature suddenly took on a spiritual dimension and was used as a metaphor for just about everything. Uh, the full poem that Schubert did not set goes something like this. Uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase. In a clear brook, a trout swims around happily. What could be more jolly than a trout in clear water with the sunshine? A fisherman comes by and wants to catch the trout, but because the water is so clear, the trout just swims away. But the fisherman sticks his boot in the water, makes it muddy, and the next thing you know, that poor trout is struggling on the end of a line with a hook through his mouth. That's all that Schubert said. The poem goes on to say, and so all of you incautious citizens, beware because your fellow man is always sticking his boot in the water to muddy it up. So keep your eyes wide open. Schubert didn't feel that it was necessary to hammer home the point like that. Instead, as you've heard in his other songs, he creates an accompaniment, which in this case actually depicts uh, the flippings and floppings of a trout in, in the water. You can actually hear the trout. All right, so sweetheart, would you please sing Die Forelle? <coughs> Just take me one second. There's actually a Schubert song called Liebhaber in allen Gestalten that starts with the wonderful line, Ich wollte, ich wäre ein Fisch. I wish I were a fish. 
So fish are not strangers to Schubert's song output. And uh, this particular fish song was very popular. Schubert, again, took his own theme and uh, incorporated it into a much larger work, the Trout Quintet, for piano, violin, viola, cello, and bass. And uh, so you can hear the marvelous trout swimming around in the middle of that quintet. Franz Liszt, who was a huge admirer of Schubert's, wrote a piano paraphrase of the trout, and it starts with a depiction of the brook that has really nothing to do with Schubert's song at all. This kind of a thing. And then when it comes back at the end, can you tell the difference? There's no F sharp the second time around because Hungarian or German for F sharp is fish. So first there is, and then there is no more fish. Yeah. I'm not sure if the audience has got that, but List, List had his little private fish joke going on in that piece. Okay. So um, somebody tell me what time it is. It might be break time. 20 after. 20 after. Let's take a break and have coffee and cookies, and then I'll play you that impromptu, and then I have another special treat for you after. Okay, thank you. All right, I promised you an impromptu from uh, Schubert's later, you know, there's, there's no late Schubert really, but <laughs> this is about as late as Schubert got. In the last 18 months of his life, Schubert just, you know, he, he'd always been writing nonstop, but now he knew he was racing the clock. And uh, all the works that you know, the, the Shepherd on the Rock and all the late piano sonatas and uh, th this impromptu that I'm going to play you, among many other impromptus that he wrote, all came from this period as he just poured out uh, one piece after another. Uh, Benjamin Britten, another great admirer of Schubert, said, it's extraordinary that a human being could even have written that much music in 18 months, but that it would be that much music of incredible quality is, is truly a miracle. So this theme uh, is roughly related to something from Rosamunda, and then there are uh, five variations in a coda.
You'll notice that by this stage in his life, Schubert shifts back and forth between major and minor so effortlessly that it seems that they coexist. One of the few things that Schubert wrote is that whenever I try to sing a song of love, it turns into a song of misery. And whenever I then try to sing a song of misery, it turns into a song of love. So in this music, uh, it always shifts back and forth. And he also said, there is no such thing as totally happy music. <laughs> you know, you may think sometimes that Schubert is totally happy, but this is always, always going on. Um, I think of a moment in another uh, impromptu, I'll just play a 30 seconds of it, when um, he's taken us deep into the dark, passionate realm of C-sharp minor and then...
that a welcome major key or what, right? Now, I have a special treat for you, another special treat. Uh, Schubert started life as a violinist and, uh, of course, was quite competent on the piano. So uh, it's surprising there aren't more works for violin and piano. But there are two extraordinary works, and uh, we are going to perform one of these for you right now. So please, a warm welcome for David Felberg. We, we are going to perform Schubert's Rondo in B minor. Now a rondo is a musical form where a certain theme returns. Excursions happen, but we always return to the theme. In this rondo, there's a slower introduction first, which leads to the two note germ that then gives birth to the theme of this rondo. So this is Schubert's Rondo in B minor.
Thank you all so much. There's nothing to follow that. <laughs> that, that is the triumphant ending. How well remember Franz Schubert. <laughs>